So I think that history will remember the 103rd running of the Indianapolis 500 as one of the classic races in history. The duel between Alexander Rossi and Simon Pagino for the victory uh, will be one of the legendary moments that people will talk about for you know decades to come. Uh, and obviously, you guys saw all of my content throughout the month of May covering just uh, kind of every nuance, every subtlety, a lot of the things like, I mean, the Fernando Alonso bump, again, that's going to be one of the most historic moments uh, of the last 30 years that people are going to be talking about decades from now. That gigantic, colossal, enormous failure of McLaren and then kind of screwing Fernando Alonso out of a, a, another chance to get the Triple Crown. How many more will he get? That'll be a story that uh, we'll be telling for a long time. But uh, there were a few things that I felt like I didn't quite have the opportunity to cover in the way I would have liked to, or at least talk about in the way I would have liked to. So in this video, I'm going to be talking a little bit more in depth about a few of the drivers that just for whatever reason, I never really gave proper credit or shout outs to uh, throughout the month of May for their performances. And I would also like to talk about the racing quality because it seems like uh, more and more in racing, fans have a higher and higher expectation of what uh, the, a good race is or what a good race needs to be or what needs to change to make a race better. And so, um, for me, uh, just to start out here, I thought the race was about as good as it possibly could have been given the circumstances. I think the last 50 laps were perfect. I thought it was, I thought the last 50 laps of the race were about as good as it could have gotten. Pa you could pass, which you couldn't do last year. In fact, look at the last five laps of this year's race versus the last 10 laps of last year's race where Will Power clearly had the dominant car all day long but couldn't pass uh, some of the vehicles that had been in the back all day like Jack Harvey and uh, Stefan Wilson. And that's not any slight on them. Their cars just weren't that good. But uh, he was unable to pass them. That would not have happened this year. I think Simon Pagino, Alexander Rossi, Takuma Sato, and a few other those front runners would have been able to blast around any lap traffic uh, in that last stint that they would have wanted to. Uh, passing was much easier. So kind of the question for many people was why were the first 150 laps, I don't want to say boring. Um, I think I said that in my, in my initial thoughts, actually in the stands. I think that's probably the wrong way to put it. I think... Unfortunately, it just wasn't as exciting as I think a lot of fans wanted it to be. But I think a lot of fans are confused on the reason why. Because I think it was pretty clear that you could have a barn burner exciting race at the very end. So why was it only the last you know, 150, 125 miles where the race really picked up? And I think the answer, and again, this is my theory. This is not you know super, super hardcore information, but I think, I think I'm pretty close on this. Remember that when I talked about the starting grid, it was the closest field. This is the closest field in the history of the Indianapolis 500. 1.8 seconds separated Simon Pagino, the uh, fastest car, from the slowest car in the field, Pippa Man. So what does that mean? Well, consider the fact that Indy 500 qualifying is a 10-mile contest. It's not just the best of one lap. So a 1.8 second gap for one lap, a one lap average would be a pretty massive gap. And it meant it would mean the field was, would be pretty spread out. 1.8 seconds over 10 miles means that every four laps, the leader will only be able to gain a maximum, or I guess in this case, maybe a little bit more considering race conditions and traffic and all that. But let's just say for the sake of argument that the race pace is 2.5 mile or uh, 2.5 seconds. So let's say they, they gain about two to three seconds a lap, the leaders do, on the back of the pack. And it would take them c quite a while to actually get up to the back of the field to lap them. Every four laps, they make up, you know, three, three seconds. So that takes them 40 laps to catch the back of the field. And so when you have, I guess parody is the right word, but it really isn't because it's, it was pretty clear to me that Simon Pagino, well above everybody else had the best car. 
Um, Alexander Rossi definitely drove the best race, I think. And that's not a slide on Simon Pagino, by the way. I think he drove the second best race. And maybe maybe 2A with Takuma Sato, who we'll talk about later. But uh, had it been 1992 instead of 2019, I think you would have seen Simon Pagino really dominate this race. He would have absolutely pulled away, probably put a lap on everybody but you know the top five. Why then did he not just absolutely you know, pull away from the rest of the field and dominate the race? In fact, if you think about it, without the strategy, Simon Pagino probably would have led nonstop the first 150 laps of the race. And there's the key, strategy. The strategy of the Indy 500 has completely shifted from what it used to be. If you think about the delta, the pit lane delta, which is the time that you it takes you to get into the pit lane, down into your box, service your car, and get back out onto the track, is probably around, you know, maybe a lap, maybe a lap, a little bit over a lap, maybe a little bit under a lap. Considering the fact that in modern Indy 500s, there are anywhere from 20 to 30 cars on the lead lap at any time, the leader has to always be thinking about stretching their fuel mileage as far as they possibly can. And the reason being is there's always a possibility that someone who's sitting back in 25th, 26th, is actually plotting a better race strategy to get to the end of the race, Alexander Rossi style, quicker than you will. You know, a, a lap in a 500 mile race, meaning, it, you know, if you stay on the lead lap at a 500 mile race, you've got a chance to win it. And so that's part of the reason why we saw such a mundane start to the race. It was because all of the leaders were trying to save fuel. They were trying to stretch it further than the guys in the back so you didn't have what you saw last year at the end of the race where you suddenly had Stefan Wilson and Oriol Servia and Jack Harvey up in there in the mix where they had not been up at the front of the field all day long. They were trying to, to kind of cover that off. And even then, guys like Simon Pagino were struggling so badly on the mileage that... Uh, you know, the strategy wasn't really working out for them. And guys like Alexander Rossi and even like Ed Carpenter, who was getting much better mileage as a Chevrolet powered car than, than Pagano was, were able to, to, to keep up with Pagano because Pagano was either going to have to save fuel or make an extra pit stop. And neither of those options were very good. And again, if this was an older style Indy 500, uh, Pagano would have, you know, pulled away and lapped everybody but fifth. And then you would have seen Pagano be able to race a heck of a lot harder because suddenly he's only racing five guys like he kind of was in this race, but he doesn't have to cover off, you know, two thirds of the field when he's making his pit stops. So that's why you saw in the final 50 laps of the race, when fuel became less of an issue, suddenly the leaders just absolutely gapped the rest of the field. They pulled away. They started passing each other and making it an incredibly exciting race. And, you know, kind of the back markers started to fall way back, but they weren't getting lapped. So had it been a fuel mileage race, you would have seen a totally different and much more um, uh, a conversational. Is that the right word? No, uh, it would have been a race of conservation rather than a race of pure speed. So let's talk about a few of the guys on race day who really impressed me. And the first one, as you saw in that title, was Connor Daly. Uh, I said at the end of last year's race that I thought Connor Daly was one of the standout drivers of the 2018 Indy 500. And many people didn't give him credit or really were able to see what he was doing because, of course, I think he had the, the slowest car in the field by a long way. He was driving the fourth string Dale Coyne racing car. And yet, in my observation of him, he just drove a very smart race. And when you looked at guys who maybe were in a similar position like James Davison, you know, they went off the track, they crashed. Daly kept in it the whole day and slogged through and was able to get a pretty decent finish, all things considered. This year was completely different. He had one of the best cars in the field. And despite the fact that he hasn't been a full-time driver for, I think, two years now, he was right there running right at the front 
and particularly and importantly he was running at the front at the end of the race now did he have anything for Rossi or Pagano no but how many times has Connor Daly really been in a position where he could win a 500 mile race I mean this was you could almost think this, this was his rookie year running at the front and him running up in the top five that whole day was was great and um and it really should be, and this is the thing, is, is it should really should be recognized because I really think he proved himself. You have to consider that the last time he was in a car anywhere near this good was when he was in the coin car in 16. And that was pre-Sebastian Bourdais coin. I mean, you have to think about how, how much Sebastian Bourdais has kind of elevated that program after he came there. And now you get to, you know, when Connor Daly was there, they just weren't. You had that re revolving door on the 19 car. It wasn't great. He gets to Andretti Autosport, even if it's for one race. He gets all that feedback. Marco, Hunter Ray, uh, Rossi, Veach. He gets to talk. Herta. He gets to talk to all those guys. And suddenly, he's the second best performing Andretti Autosport car. So, you know, if, if life were fair, and I know it's not, he would be in a seat already. And hopefully, Michael or one of the sponsors is is going to try to get Connor Daly into a seat because his performance in the 500 was exactly what it should have been and he definitely proved that he was worthy of an Andretti Autosport ride. So if you watch my Detroit videos already, you knew this was coming. Uh, I needed to talk about Santino Ferrucci because Santino was the rookie of the year in this year's Indianapolis 500. And I don't think I gave him enough credit and I will... I will own this one. I kind of overlooked him a little bit or maybe purposely overlooked in some respects because I guess I kind of got Carlos Munoz again where if you will remember back to 2013 or maybe you don't go back that far so I'll tell you the story. Carlos Munoz came in in 2013, Indy Lights driver with Andretti Autosport, got a ride with for the 500. Everybody thought, okay, this guy's going to crash. Then he goes out there and practice and qualifying, and he runs lower than anybody else. He looks like a madman. He's doing all sorts of crazy, um, insane driving techniques, and you think, this guy's going to send it into the wall. Turns out he doesn't. He finishes second in the race, and had it gone green to the end, he might have challenged Kanan for the win. Santino Ferrucci had a very Carlos Munoz rookie year. Sure, he didn't really, he wasn't ever in true competitiveness with the front runners. But if you look at uh, in some of those last shots on the last couple of laps, he's right in the camera shot with Ed Carpenter and Simon Pagano and Will Power. And I mean, he drove a brilliant race. And he drove a great month of May. I mean, he just was hooked up the whole time. In fact, the whole Dale Coyne racing team was hooked up. James Davison was fast, and not a lot of people talked about him. Sebastian Bourdais was fast, and not a lot of people talked about him. Santino Ferrucci was fast, and not a lot of people talked about him. Um, and Santino has been driving so well this season. He really has been. Uh, he's just driven very maturely. Uh, he hasn't wrecked a whole... I can't even... Has he crashed once? He might have crashed in St. Pete... But that might have been in practice, so I, I don't think he's even crashed this year yet. So, I mean, he's doing a great job. I mean, he's really being a becoming a very solid driver, and in a lot of ways, he's outperformed Sebastian Bourdais. I mean, again, he beat Sebastian in the 500. That's difficult to do considering how much of a champion Sebastian is, and his avoiding action um, in the big one, so to speak, was pretty legendary. I have to say, I mean, it was really. An exciting maneuver and um, I mean a lot of that has to do with uh, with luck and skill and you, you need both of those in the Indy 500 um, at this point I think uh, I think he's earned a second season already uh, I would like to see how he develops and you saw how fast he was in Detroit that's one of the few tracks he has experience on so going into next season assuming he sticks with coin he could develop into a, a race winning driver and that, uh, I think that's something that a lot of people were not necessarily expecting from him uh, at the beginning of the season. And finally, we need to talk about the 2017 Indy 500 winner, uh, Takuma Sato, who finished third in the race and came out of virtually nowhere after losing a lap very early on in the race. And we shouldn't be surprised. 
I was surprised, a lot of people were surprised, but we shouldn't have been surprised about Takuma Sato and his performance. Consider this. He was out of the race before, I think, even the first pit stop in 2018. That was technically his defense of his 2017 Indianapolis 500, and unfortunately he got caught up in that uh, shimazzle with James Davison. So really, this was the first race that Takuma Sato, since his Indy 500 win, has been able to go 500 miles and try to defend his Indy 500 victory from 17. And I think he defended it very well. And I think anybody who was saying, oh, I don't know about Sato as an Indy 500 winner, this might be one of the worst Indy 500, you're full of crap. It's pretty clear at this point, and I said this in a couple of other videos, that I think Takuma Sato is driving better than he has his entire career at 42 years old. And people are going to hate me for making this comparison, and I understand, but it's very reminiscent of Emerson Fittipaldi. Now, obviously, he's not a two-time world champion. He never reached that level of success in Formula One. But this is very MO-like to have a career after Formula One where arguably he drives better than he ever did in Formula One, wins more races, uh, and looks at times dominant. And even when he doesn't have a car, like he, he I don't think the Ray Hall cars were quite there this year. They were definitely better than they were last year. But he drove to third, and you know he's up there battling with Andretti and Penske, the two teams that have absolutely owned the Indy 500 the last few years, and he's right there. And had there been some sort of a coming together between Pagano and Rossi, Sato would be a two-time Indy 500 champion. So, I mean, and, and one of the restarts, I don't even think NBC caught this. I'm going to put up my own footage right now of Takuma Sato passing guys three wide on the outside in turn three unbelievable driving skill I mean wow Sato he made me he definitely made me a believer when he won the 500 the first time and um, and I, I I would hope there are no doubters anymore after his performance in the 500 and really his performances this entire year he is just very worthy uh, of of the accolades that he is now getting because it's amazing what a little bit of confidence will do with a lot of talent. And I think that's kind of what's happened with Takuma Sato. And it's, it's fun to watch because he is a fun driver. I mean, his, his motto that everybody says, no attack, no chance. I mean, that, that's such a fun driver to watch when, uh, when you take risks like that. And again, I mean, that's the type of driver that, that wins the Indy 500 now. That's why Alexander Rossi is so good. That's why Robert Wickens was so good when he was driving. Such aggression. Uh, very, very fast, you know, willing to take risks. And Takuma is an older guy who's willing to take risks, which is really crazy. So um, that was my in-depth look at this year's Indianapolis 500. Did I miss anything else? Maybe I should have talked about Marco going five laps down. I don't know. Um, but if you did enjoy this, let me know down in the comments. Let me know your thoughts uh, as well, because that's always fun to read. Uh, this has been David Land on YouTube, and we will see you in the next video.